I'm so glad to be here today. I, I've been sensing uh, for quite some time now just something that the Lord wants to share with us. And uh, it started quite some time to go, uh, some time ago. Um, last October, I shared a sermon called The Prayer of Preparation. Uh, it, it was uh, rooted in the scripture in Hosea 10, 12, which says, break up the unplowed ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. And this is a word that God spoke to me personally. Break up the unplowed ground. If you were here, you were probably scared by the fact that I took a large sledgehammer and broke up a large piece of concrete during this sermon. And uh, I didn't realize how loud it was, but I guess people got scared by it. But the idea is, is that God is breaking up things that are hard in our lives, things that have not been touched by the sensitivity and the love of the Lord in the while, maybe never, and he wants to do something new. Break up the unplowed ground for it is time to seek the Lord. We were seeking the Lord last year. Of course, we're doing it this year too, especially during what's going on. But last year was a year of preparation, a year of prayer. And we prayed all year. We had prayer meetings and we had special times of prayer within the service and, and opportunities to pray online and things like that. And so we broke up the unplowed ground. We were seeking the Lord until he comes. And I don't know what that looks like. I just know one thing. There's no doubt he's coming, amen? There's no doubt until he comes is really when he comes. And he's either going to come for us personally and we are going to be radically transformed and in his presence in our death, or he's going to come in some new and unique way that might come out of trial and travail. Now, I didn't know this was going to happen when I shared this message last October. I had no idea 2020 was going to be what it was so far in the first six months. Have you guys seen that stuff on Facebook that talks about, I don't know how I'm going to make it through the next six months. The first six months was so amazing and crazy. I mean, it's been nuts, hasn't it? You've had to adjust to things and, and, uh, and, and be challenged by things and trust the Lord in new ways. How exciting is that? And we had no idea that was going to be like that last year. And I had no idea that that scripture in, in, in Hosea 10, 12 was going to have meaning more than just for me, but maybe for all of us. And one of the other scriptures that I shared regarding this on that day in October was Hebrews 12, 26 through 28. It says, at this time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken will remain. You guys, this is what's happening. It was a shaking in my life last year, and I think it is a shaking in all of our lives this year. And not just our lives. This globe is being shaken. Is it not? It is being shaken by God saying, I want to purify this place. I want only the things that are eternal, only the things that are important, that are going to last forever. I want people to hold on to those things. And not the things that are temporal, the things that are temporary, the things that will degrade and fall apart over the years, over the centuries, and over eternity. He doesn't want us holding on to those things. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Do you think it's possible? I think it is. God has done a great shaking in my life. I have had to trust in him more than ever before. I've been a Christian for over 40 years, and it's very easy to hold on to my maturity, to my experience, to my knowledge, all these things. It is very easy to hold on to. Even, even the comforts of life, it is very easy to hold on to those things, yes? And to, and to trust a little in those things for your comfort, for your security. But God has shaken those things in my life, and I believe he is shaking those in all of our lives. I had no idea what was going to happen come February here. And yet I believe that what God was speaking to me last year 
is something that God is moving forward even in this year as well. And I'd like to talk to you more about it. We're talking about coronavirus and Christian living. It's not just coronavirus. It's everything associated with coronavirus. It's the social justice. It's the rights issues. It's the political issues. All these things are a little a part of what I want to talk to you today about when we talk about coronavirus and Christian living. We need to view the world as God views the world. Otherwise, we can make some serious mistakes, and we'll see that throughout our time talking today, that, that, that God, when we, when we trust in God, because his ways are not our ways, his thinking is not like ours, when we go with his way instead of another way, we're going to be blessed because of it. It's going to, it's going to make a lot more sense for us. And that's why I want to talk about worldview today. I, I have three points, and the first one is, what is worldview? Have, have you heard of that phrase before? Raise your hand if you've heard of that phrase. If you're at home, raise your hand or comment on Facebook about it if you've heard of that phrase. It's kind of a, an unusual term, but it's, it's an important term that I think we really need to grab a hold of and understand as Christians because this is a serious time. And there are serious consequences to what we believe and how we view the world. So that's what I want to talk about. A worldview refers to the framework of ideas or beliefs forming a global description which an individual, group, or culture watches and interprets the world and interacts with. So just to put that in layman's terms, it's how you view the world is, is, is kind of like a, a global thing for, you, for us as individuals. It's not just we, we pick and choose, although we can pick and choose a little, but mostly we have a worldview that has been determined by, by multiple options through input, through teachers, input through families, and through input through the Bible and other ways through culture. And we kind of view the world like that. And I want to talk to you and describe it a little more because, again, this is so important for us to grasp hold of. There are different types of worldviews. There is an ideological worldview, which has to do with political or economic beliefs. One of that would be capitalism. You know, when you think of a capitalistic worldview, you think about, you know, competition to, to try and, and make it. And, and it's almost a little about survival of the fittest. And that's kind of the way it is. Very different than a communistic point of view where, where uh, everybody is kind of subjugated to being the same in a certain way. So you can see how cultures develop differently based on a point of view or a, a worldview. It could be a philosophical worldview, one where a teacher, an educator, a respected person has thoughts and ideas that now develop into something that we grab hold of and say, this is how we view the world based on Socrates or, or based on uh, a set of moral principles that some leader set forth. Relativism is is a philosophical worldview. One view that would be that, hey, whatever, whatever you do is okay because there is no absolute truth. It is relative. And so whatever your truth is, is a truth that you can stand on. The only problem with that is that uh, a relativistic point of view is absolute in itself in saying that there is no absolute truth. And that's a big problem. Can you see that being a problem? We're not going to go into that today, but it is a big issue. It is a big uh, philosophical worldview today, and uh, it's one that should be challenged because it uh, has no uh, true logical sense to it. The next is a religious uh, worldview, one grounded in the scriptures and a set of beliefs. Dr. Jeff Myers says that it's a worldview, that a, a biblical worldview is a set of patterns ideas, beliefs, convictions that make sense of God and the world and how we relate to God and the world. And it's that biblical worldview that I want to challenge you with today because I think in the midst of what we're going through, there is an issue. And the issue is, is that as Christians, we have embraced in some ways other worldviews 
that, that confuse us and now uh, help us to be less effective in a biblical worldview, a biblical mindset for our own sake and also for the sake of the world. I think that diagram's up right now. Oh, my picture's in there too. I feel very uh, two-dimensional these days. <laughs> uh, so in, in this picture of, of, of worldview, we have uh, the, the idea of what is real. What is real is going to determine your worldview. What you think is real is going to determine your worldview. And so if you, if you look at the worldview of someone who is a, a natural atheist, uh, you're going to see a worldview of only the observable universe. Only what is observable is real. And that is going to be the beginning of your worldview. If you have a biblical worldview, you are going to have a worldview that says that there is God and there is a spiritual dimension to life. It is not just the observable universe, even down to the smallest particles. It is also something that is spiritual and invisible that is a part of that in, in our worldview. And then as you go on to uh, the worldview, it determines what is true, what you believe is true. And that determines your beliefs. It informs your beliefs. So what is true for a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, is in the beginning, God. That, that, that is where everything begins for a Christian, a biblical worldview. For an atheistic point, uh, point of view, it is, it is based on, and uh, these words uh, are, are true words for, from an atheistic point of view, mindless, unguided processes that lead us to where we are today. That is how we are sitting in our chairs today. That is how we are seeing. That is how we are breathing through mindless, unguided processes that took us to this day over eons and eons of time. And if you have that point of view, it goes from what is true to what is good. What are your values? It informs our values based on that point of view. And, and so what is good is that for, for an atheist point of view is it's a morality from mindless, unguided uh, development. It is not based on some invisible entity that gave us a set of guidelines of what is right or wrong, which would be a, a Christian point of view. And so these developed uh, in an atheist point of view from eons and eons of time and people out of, out of just being mindless uh, uh, development came up with also moral development, which is a problem in itself in the invisible nature of that. It kind of breaks down because the atheistic point of view is one of that the invisible elements do not apply and are not a part of the reality. And then, of course, uh, what is good and, and, and which informs our values also takes us to what we do, our behavior. The behavior of someone who is a, is a believer, who has a biblical point of view, is that we are empowered by God, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to hear what is good from him through the word of God, through the Bible, but also empowered to be able to live that out and called to live that out for an atheistic point of view. Richard Dark Dawkins, one of the greatest atheists, uh, of our time, said that we, th the way we come to an understanding of our behavior is that we dance to our own DNA. We dance to our own DNA, which means that everything that's organic within us, all the details of things that are within us, are the things that drive us to do what we do, regardless of whether they're good or evil. Ravi Zacharias said about worldview that uh, it has to answer several questions. One is our origin. Where do we come from? Two is our meaning. Why are we here? Three is morality. What, what should we do? And fourth is destiny. Where are we headed? And that he says that the, the only uh, intellectually satisfying answer for this is a biblical worldview. And I believe that that's the case especially in a world that, that we experience today. We've seen this. Everyone has a worldview, 
regardless of whether you just heard about this concept today or you've known about it for, for many years, everyone has a worldview. And I'd like to look in John and look at Jesus' worldview. As a matter of fact, this is a worldview that, uh, th- that has an amazing discussion in it between Jesus and Pilate. And we look and we see in this discussion, and Jesus is very close to, to being condemned to death and crucified, uh, only to raise again in three days. And the discussion is between the one who will condemn him and himself. And let's read it uh, right now. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Why would he ask that question? He had a political worldview. He was looking at the world from a political standpoint. Are you, are you a part of this political party or this political party? Oops, did I say that? Okay, we'll get into that a little later. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And again, uh, Pilate is, is really then talking about between Jew and Roman, between a Jewish worldview uh, and a Roman worldview. And he's saying, you know, I don't have your worldview about these things. And so I'm not going to answer you according to your worldview. I'm going to answer you according to my worldview. Can you see how worldview played so much into this discussion between Jesus and Pilate? This was exactly what the discussion was about. Matter of fact, Jesus addresses it now, blatantly saying it. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. The key to understand Jesus is that he had a biblical worldview. Of course he did. He's the Logos. He is the Word of God, right? And and so he understands the world through a worldview that is true reality because he is the one who created it. He danced to a different drummer than anyone on earth. He challenged Pilate. He challenged other leaders within, within the community challenged the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He even challenged his own disciples. He even challenged his own disciples. This was a discussion about truth, which is basically a discussion about worldview. Because what is the next thing that Jesus says? In fact, The reason I was born and came to the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to who? Me. Me. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And what does Pilate say? What is truth? This was an entire discussion, a philosophical discussion of what is the worldview that we should follow. 25 times in John, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Amen, amen. I say to you, this is what is true. This is not his kingdom. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Not of this world. And Paul wrote in Romans 12, 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world view, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to a biblical worldview, God's worldview. What happens when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind to have a biblical worldview. According to that diagram with the circles, your actions start changing. Your actions start changing. My next point is, what happens when worldviews collide? 
which is where we are now in our society. Here we are in, in, this, uh, in this chapter in John, and we see that there are two worldviews that are colliding. Two worldviews that are colliding here between Pilate and Jesus. There are lots of examples of worldviews colliding. You can see that Peter collided with Jesus' worldview when he was cutting off the ear, trying to defend Jesus. He thought, I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to cut off this, this uh, guy's ear who's attacking my Lord. I'm going to cut off his ear. And what does Jesus say? Stop. Those who draw the sword will die by the sword. He stopped him right there in his tracks. And Jesus' worldview overshadowed Peter's worldview at that point. There are other worldview uh, encounters that we see as Jesus teaches. He talks about that the greatest is going to be the least. That is, is probably the craziest uh, uh, reality of, of God's worldview is, is that we become the least. We become the servant of all to become the greatest. How does that play into a capitalistic point of view? How does that play into a freedom worldview that, that talks about rights, that talks about, I, I deserve these rights? When Jesus says, the greatest is the least, choose to be the least. The greatest clash of worldview happened at the cross related to this. It happened at the cross. Philippians 2, we have, we have Paul talking about Jesus at the cross and, and what he was doing. And, and, and Paul described the expression of Jesus' worldview in a way that, that should change us forever when it comes to our situation that we're in in 2020. Paul says you must have the same attitude of that of of Jesus Christ. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. How many worldviews does that go against? Every world view, but the world view of the Bible. God's world view says surrender. God's world view doesn't say assert. It says surrender. Surrender. Don't assert your rights. Surrender your rights. Is that not what Jesus just did? He surrendered himself. The one who called himself God, the one who was God, the one who had every right to assert himself did not. And we are Christians. We follow Christ. And so in the same worldview, we do the same thing. We, we, we surrender our rights for the sake of the one who loves us and the kingdom that we follow. Biblical worldview is not just one's personal faith expression. It's something that encompasses our whole life. You cannot, uh, you have to have a co cohesive biblical worldview. It needs to encompass all areas of your life, your work life, your play life, your family life, your worship life, every aspect of your life, your financial life, every aspect of your life needs to be claimed by a biblical worldview. But what do we do? Often we compartmentalize our worldviews. And we, we, can, we can take a little of this. Well, uh, I know that uh, you know, we're supposed to love and, and, and surrender our rights, but you know what? I'm an American, and so within an American worldview, I should assert my rights. Here we have a combination of two, of two worldviews coming together, that clash like I was describing with Jesus and Peter or Jesus and Pilate. It is a clash of worldviews that says, because I'm an American and because I am a Christian, it is okay to assert 
my rights. I need to do what I, I need to be able to own the things and take care of myself and defend myself. That is not in the word of God, is it? It got quiet in here, I'm sorry. I am going to delicately and respectfully step on toes in a few minutes here, but I believe it's because God has a very high purpose for all of us. So I hope you forgive me ahead of time for it. Francis Schaeffer says this. Francis Schaeffer, a great uh, philosophy uh, theologian uh, who understood about worldview and taught on it. He's dead now. But he says we have a responsibility with our worldview. We have a responsibility to know what our worldview is and to decide whether we agree with it or not. He says this, people have presuppositions and they will live more consistently on the basis of those presuppositions that even they themselves may realize. Most people catch their presuppositions from their family and surrounding society, the way that a child catches the measles. (laughs) But people with understanding realize that their presuppositions that's a hard word to say, presuppositions should be chosen after a careful consideration of which worldview is true. And so I challenge us all today to do that very thing, that we have a responsibility to God and to ourselves and those we love to look at our worldview and decide whether it lines up with the word of God, with the Bible itself. And if it does, praise God, But I guarantee you, I've been a Christian over 40 years, and I am constantly coming against things, constantly coming up against ways that my worldview is being challenged by the biblical worldview, and I need to repent. I need to change my mind and turn around and go the way of the Bible. It is very easy to syncretize or to bring together, synergize worldviews and not realize we're doing it. In 1980s, a syncretism of worldviews, a synergy of worldviews came together that was unhealthy for the church. It was a conservative worldview with a biblical worldview. They came together and it caused us trouble, and it still does, and the reputation of the church has been damaged by it. We can only have one worldview as the church. We must have God's worldview. We must agree with God and not agree with anything else outside of what God agrees to. So now I'm getting to the part you're going to have to forgive me for. Raise your hand if you've already forgiven me. Oh, gosh, I'm in trouble. (laughs) Hopefully you guys at home are more generous. So... If Jesus were to come to you today, what would he be talking about? If Jesus came in this room, would he preach about masks? Yes, masks, no masks. Would he preach about politics? Yes, Trump, no Trump. Would he preach about rights? The guy who surrendered all his rights, what do you think? He wouldn't. What would he preach about? He would preach about love, exactly. He would preach about love. God looks at eternity and he says, this is what is important. And we need to remember that what he sees is a clear picture and we only see through a a mask dimly. (laughs) I didn't say that. Through a mask, didn't we? All right, I like that. Christianity is not conservative or liberal. Christianity is not Republican or Democrat. Christianity is not masked or unmasked. I hope you can hear this. I pray that we can all have an open heart to knowing that this is true and being able to walk in what that reality means that we would focus on love. I heard it said that the things that are happening in our society, the things that are causing uproar in our society are weapons 
of mass distraction from the ch- for the church. And I believe that that is the case. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've been a part of it. I am not above having these discussions as well. Weapons of mass distraction. And so, after the collision of worldviews that we have, how should we now live? How should we now live? And I'm going to close in just a minute. Maybe we can have a musician come on up. We are in an unprecedented time in history. You should know that. You should know that this time is not like any other time. Now, there were great times in the world, and, and they were magnificent too, but we live in a time like no other time, and God has something magnificent for us as a church, as the world, something magnificent for us. So how do we live with all this conflict about worldview? Because we hear it every day, we see it on social media. What are we going to do? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race set out for us. There is a race that is set out for us. For you and for me, it is a race to follow Christ to know him and to love him with an everlasting love. The race marked marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Every time I read this scripture, it reminds me of when I I learned how to uh, sail in summer camp. It was quite, quite the exciting experience. You got that picture? Oh, that's me. That's me in summer camp. Man, I was 13 there. Like that hair? Uh, okay, take that one off. <laughs> in summer camp, I learned how to sail. And I remember going out there and I got, a, I got in the sailboat. And, you know, it was just a two-person boat on this beautiful lake. And, and uh, I, I was going out there and I was, I was trying to stay straight. And, and, and go straight, and, and I couldn't. And finally, the person that was with me said, this is how you go straight. This is how you get to where you want to go. You find the mark, and you f- fix your eyes on it. You fix your eyes on the destination, and you don't take your eyes off of it, and you can get there. You can fix your eyes. So what do I say? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Today, there are distractions everywhere. There are arguments everywhere. They might be even arguments in your very home. Yes? There are in ours. (laughs) Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix them on the one who is the author and perfecter of your faith. And how do we do that? How do we do that? What is God interested in? We heard it over there from Kerry. He is interested in love. So so what are the things he's interested in? He's interested in what Jesus said. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is what we are to do. Every expression from us in the significant time that we are in right now, every expression out of our mouths, out of our Facebook, out of our Instagram, and our conversations should be expressions of love. We are not in an average time. We are in a unique time. God is doing something very unique. And so it should be love. What is the greatest expression of love? The Great Commission, go out into the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, do you know how many people outside of this room and maybe in this room today need to know that God loves them with an everlasting love, that God forgave them of their sins so that they could enter into a relationship that will forever change them? 
a relationship that is rock solid because the grace of God and nothing else that we can hold on to with all of our love, all of our might, because God has held on to us first. How incredible is that? Amen. So I just want to close with one scripture and one concept. The Karate Kid, one of my favorite movies. And, you know, Mr. Miyagi, this great sage. And, you know, here's this kid, the Karate Kid. And he's like, man, I can do this. I can do this, right? I can do this. Yeah, you don't have to teach me anything. I could just do it. Just show me the moves, right? And, and so Miyagi starts showing him some moves, and, and, uh, and he starts doing it. He thinks he's like, oh, cool. He's got it all together. He's got his confidence going. And, and then Miyagi says, you need to focus. You need to focus. And then he said, and then the karate kid says, I am focused. I am focused. And then Miyagi takes him and twists him in a knot. And he's hanging over the edge, over the water. He's that far from the water. And he's looking at it and he's like freaking out. Like, what's going on? And Miyagi quietly and calmly says, your focus needs focus. This is what God wants to do for the church. Your focus needs focus. Luke 19.41 says this and the following. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known of this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and your children within the walls. They will leave, not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. I believe that we are in no other time in history other than a God time, that he wants to revive the church, revive me, revive you, and this is the time we are to recognize his coming. Could you stand with me? We're going to pray. Those of you at home, I welcome you to stand as well. We need to respond to the Lord. This is the time. This is the time. Amen? We need to recognize it, and we need to walk in it. We need to mobilize, not to criticize people's point of view, but to proclaim the goodness of God, the love of God, the salvation of God to everyone who is worried, everyone who is fearful, everyone who's struggling financially, everyone who's dealing with this crisis. Guess what? That's everyone. We have a job to do, church. We need to mobilize. We need to live the worldview that Christ has given us to love God and love people. Drop every distraction you have and mobilize for the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't worry that you might stand out as someone strange or unusual. Boldly go out and do what God has for you to do. And let us see what God is going to do. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we, we just come before you and... Lord, we want to surrender to you the things that are, that are not a part of your worldview. The arguments, the needing to assert our rights, the needing to have our opinions. There is only one opinion you're interested in, and that is the opinion of love. And so we just surrender to you. And Lord, we repent. I repent for, for, for so often times thinking that my opinion uh, is, is over your truth. We just surrender to that. I pray, God, that our church, that the church, the global church, would walk out with this understanding and be transformed by the renewing of your mind, accomplishing your purpose, that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. If you heard the gospel today and I shared it with you about his love and forgiveness and, and you want to hear more, 
I encourage you to come on up. There'll be a few people up here in the live audience. And uh, just come on up, and, and we'd be happy to talk with you and pray with you. And at home, if you want to comment, uh, we'd be happy to follow up with you as well. God bless you, and have a great day. Thanks.